Let's jump on to the next bit then. We're going hardcore mm -hmm. here. We're going hardcore into the Cobb Douglas function, some kind of a production function. So um, so let me see if I'm uh, getting this correct from the modeling. So in reality, like uh, there would be, say I am in a work production, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a workplace and we put forward our, our, as our, as our workers council, we put forward our, what we will produce next year. Mm -hmm. Um, that's given that we will request certain inputs and we'll say with those inputs we'll produce this now when it comes to the modeling it seems to me like that you're using these production functions as a way to estimate given the inputs what the output will be but in reality our we're not saying that the these workers councils actually create a production function they just say give us this we'll do that am i correct yeah. Your read of that is correct. We're simulating with math and computer code how we think people within consumer and worker councils are going to behave. And this program and this program, and well as the mathematics powering it, um, are our best guess based on standard, well-known uh, mathematics and economics ideas, how we think that would pay out, play out. Um, the uh, on um, in the particular example of what's referred to as a Cobb-Douglas function, those uh, functions there would um, involve things that, upon reflection, you think you would need, the, the kinds of resources that you would need, the kinds of labor you would need to input, um, the various changes to those respective um, goods and inputs, um, everything else that isn't like labor and capital uh, for that, and then you would all aggregate them out, and at the end would be some output that you would produce, whether it would be a computer program, a loaf of bread, a couch, whatever uh, socially valued output you deliver back. We're simulating that with an economy, which is the best guess based on how economists and how his economists historically have done this. We're adapting that here for a participatory economy. Right. So a, a capitalist firm might use one of these production functions they might want to estimate jesus if we if we try and produce so much either all or our inputs what do we expect to get out and they'll use something like a production function for their planning purposes and we're saying we're using this type of thing for our modeling okay cool let's jump into the next bit then so then we have what uh these what we call are these well-being functions so these are things these are functions where we're trying to describe essentially the net benefit in in some term like to uh in one case it'll be the workers council they'll have a have a well-being function and then another case we'll get to them in a, in a few minutes the the consumer councils have a well-being function so in this we're trying to essentially um trying to 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 get all of these well-being functions i assume so this is a question for you we're trying to we're trying to uh, both maximize but make sure all these well-being functions are greater than zero i assume is that is that what you're when you say five percent is that what like would is five percent of these ones not no the five percent threshold refers to the threshold of a mismatch between of of what's referred to as the mismatch of a surplus the idea that how much more stuff do you have com compared to how much stuff do you anticipate consuming okay. the difference of that would be at around five percent or less or better, um, the, uh, 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 within the parameters of the model that we had computed. That's not this. What we're seeing here is within a given workplace, uh, determine um, not just the output, which you're right, a capitalist economy would just care about that and throw everything to the side, the well-being of the laborers, uh, the well-being of the um, environment, all, all things that, you would, that um, capitalists would just you know, throw out and ignore and pretend doesn't exist. We're trying to account for, but uh, using more or less the lines of the same kind of theory that economists have used for um, uh, computing how a workplace actually works. We're adapting that to account for, well, we want a better workplace within a larger parameter of an economy that we think is a better economy. How would that work? And uh, that what we did was to adapt that for um, uh, at least the mathematical modeling of that that we later turned into code and ran as a simulation of. Okay, 
So in this, we've got like uh, we've got a lot of stuff. I can't go into all the details of the equation, but we have uh, well, there's two kind of questions, two bits that jump out to me here. We've got one uh, vector in here, our matrix, which is the natural resources, and that is like an input-output matrix. I think for um, for uh, you know limited natural resources, raw materials, maybe land stuff right. like that yes. okay so that the way that it's modeled here to me it is seems to be optimizing for a kind of social good output on some level uh like what these functions the well-being functions are trying to well what am i trying to say here that the it is not taking um it is not taking into account um externalities it's just merely uh apportioning uh the raw materials etc um to the most productive function within the economy. Is that a fair point? Um, yes and no. Um, if we, you'll notice that within the parameter of the, um, uh, within the formula and each of the components that you raise, while yes, there are matrices there, for example, for natural resources, there is also the added in matrix P, which is the indicative prices. You're talking about externalities, um, externalities within a capitalist economy by that very name are ignored. We in a participatory economy do our best to not do that. And we do that by, at least in the mathematical modeling of that, by accounting for that with indicative prices, which indicate, among other things, the environmental impact of one or another uh, consumption choice regarding natural resources. What are you using? What are the impacts of that? That would be handled by the indicative prices, which are part of the multiplication of that matrix in the result that that comes out of that. So yes, we do handle that, and we strive to handle that as well as we can to the to the extent possible within this model and within a future economy as such. So. Well, I come back to you and say like that within the the uh, calculation of these indicative prices for these outputs. So we'd have a, a price for the output mm -hmm. uh, would be you know would be multiplying uh, by the raw materials uh, within this function. But the prices of the outputs are essentially determined in the algorithm that you've done here, right? Is that correct? Like these PZ are determined by you solve. You're, you're constantly trying to get towards closer indicative prices that will get us to that zero percent. That's correct. But, the prices themselves will change, and we right. expect them to change. And the, at least within the course of figuring out um, a participatory plan, they may actually also change within the course of um, an economy, the running of an economy generally. And that's fine. In fact, we would expect that because resources will. Uh, become more available or not, the environmental impacts or other impacts of that within the larger society or larger universe will change or not. Um, and the prices of those uh, of, of those taken in aggregate will be affected. And that's the whole point of this model, or at least a point of this model, is to take that seriously and, and include that within the parameters of figuring out a, a, a ultimately a society-wide economic plan. But here, within the parameters of figuring out uh, a workplace. Okay, but um, like in the literature I've read that the algorithm for, for getting towards these Ps, so, so solving for these indicative prices, tends to be a kind of a balancing between supply and demand and what's produced and output. Mm -hmm. Are you saying then that to get towards environmental, taking into, a, into account the environmental stuff that we would have then a subjective uh, input by somebody or some people into determining these P's outside of the automated kind of algorithmic solving of the supply and demand issues? Within the parameters of the model that we've coded up, the prices are actually computed by um, a formula that we've also included in as a price adjustment rule. We don't see that here in, in the particular slide that's being demonstrated, but um, we've tried to account for that. As far as how that would actually be modeled within the course of an economy, um, and that's a great question. I would imagine, I, I actually have not given that a whole lot of thought. I would reason, but I'm open to correction on this, that that would actually be handled kind of like maybe subjectively based on best available information about like if I'm going to be um, burning gasoline to run my car, um, and that will be having environmental impacts, like you know, raising 
um, putting more carbon in the atmosphere to raise global warming. What are the aggregate impacts? Of, what are the impacts of that? Uh, of, um, and uh, reflecting that in the price as such. And there's going to be some degree of both subjectivity and objectivity. How much do I think it's going to be? But also, what does the evidence say regarding what are going to be the tangible impacts of that? So, uh, uh, but you pose a good question. Um, I don't think I really have the full satisfactory answer. My estimate is that it's going to be probably a combination of both subjective and objective effects, um, but with also an eye to always try to improve those to reflect the best state of knowledge about the economy.